welcome students and graduates, parents and supporters of Grace Reform Protestant School to the 2023 graduation. We certainly have much to be thankful for this year, even though it was a trying year and a trying time for students and for teachers and all involved in the school. We who are in Jesus Christ have the privilege of looking back over the year and seeing that all things worked for our salvation and we have that hope. And we're going to spend a few moments dwelling upon the ways in which we're thanking God for this evening. Uh, first of all, God provided us with everything that we need for this school, so he provided us with covenant youth who are precious to him, whom he loves. He provided us with teachers who love the truth and who are dedicated to teaching that truth of the gospel to their students and all subjects. He provided us with many aides and secretaries and those who gave of their spiritual gifts and time in many unique ways to help the school run well. He gave to us parents who have sacrificed much to be able to provide a Christian education for their students. He gave unto us an association from which this school was born. He gave unto us a board who makes decisions on behalf of the school, sometimes very difficult decisions. And he gave to us a spirit which has led us to lift up prayers that God would bless and continue to bless our school. And I want to give a special appreciation for those who have spent the last few weeks hurrying to get things done for tonight. And that is appreciated and that is also a gift of God. So many will say tonight in graduation speeches or around this time of year that this is only possible because of God's faithfulness to us, and that's true. That's something we confess, that only God's faithfulness is the reason that we are here. But I'd like to add something else, too. Without God's blessing, the only thing that our work would accomplish is to serve to our own condemnation, because our work laboring at the school was not perfect, was mixed with sin, it was tainted by sin, polluted with sin, and without that blessing of God, without Jesus Christ, this work would be nothing but a curse to us, and that's something I think we ought to keep in our minds. All the labor that the students did, the hours that they sat in the classroom and learned, the hours of working on their homework that they did, the teachers, they prepared lesson plans for hours, taught for hours, all the blood, the sweat, and the tears, all the time and effort that have gone into this school would only have served to the curse if not for our Savior Jesus Christ, because again, that work was far from perfect. And so I want to point us to our school's true need tonight, and I hope that message gets across with the ceremony as well. The school needs Christ, and the school needs Christ's righteousness to cover it, needs Christ's righteousness to cover our sin, and that is our hope, too. Our hope doesn't lie in men. It doesn't lie in how many students we have. It doesn't lie in the ability of our teachers. It doesn't lie in the strength of our board. It lies in God's promise to his people, and we're going to hear more about that promise from our speaker, but I'd like to read a little bit of the verse that the seniors chose for their text that points to a promise of God, and that verse goes like this. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Fear not, for I am with thee. Now I'd like to read from Psalm 46, and then we'll open in prayer. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help, and trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with a swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. 
The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, he cutteth the spear in sunder, he burned the chariot with the fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with, is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Let's open with the word of prayer. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Thy name, which is Jehovah, the I Am. That name which reveals to us thy sovereignty, which displays to us thy infinity, and which manifests to us thy self-sufficiency. The I Am, which tells of all thy unchangeableness, which tells then declares thy might and power, thy name which shouts to all that thou alone art God. And thy name is jealous, jealous for thy honor, jealous for thy glory, jealous for all the praise and worship of every creature on the face of the earth and in the universe. And in thy jealousy, all those who do not praise and worship thee perfectly are made guilty before thy face and are worthy of eternal death and punishment. So great is thy jealousy and so great is thy righteousness and thy justice. And thy name is mercy, thy name is grace, and eternal love, so that thou and thy infinite will sent thy Son into this world to cause him that he lived a life of righteousness before thy face, a perfect life that pleased thee, he who took upon himself all of our sin and made himself guilty who was innocent and indeed made the wickedest sinner to ever live, that we may be set free, that the curse may not fall upon us but fell upon our Savior. And he who rose on the third day to testify to all that that promise of salvation was finished and complete and who ushers now to us thy spirit, that causes to work in us faith and to walk in thy ways and giving us all the blessings of Jesus Christ. Truly we say with the prophet Jonah, salvation is of the Lord. We praise and thank thee, a God who brought us another year of school, school that has been marked by controversy. We see thy faithfulness in this too. Father, we have no words to describe what has happened but the words of the psalm which we have just read, the earth was removed and shaken and mighty mountains were cast into the sea so that we are left with no pastor, three fewer elders, one fewer deacon, fewer families. We know this is thy will and we know that thy purposes are sure and thy promises to thy church are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so we look to thee, truly thou art the only true God. May we never trust in man, may we never trust in the wisdom of man nor the will of man, but may we trust in thee alone. And may we thank thee continually for our Savior Jesus Christ who brought us here tonight that he may be worshipped and praised above all names. Father, we thank thee that thou hast been with us in this school year and blessed us freely with everything that we need for our school, even though we are sinful and rebellious. And we ask that tonight thy holy name is praised and given all the honor and all the glory and that we are made nothing. Keep us from sin. Forgive us of our sins for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll now have sixth through eighth grade come up and sing a couple of numbers for us.
correction to our program. Joel Budbile is not quite yet the board president. That happens on July 1. So our current board president, Ed Uphoff Sr., should be the one you see there closing in prayer and then handing out Bibles to the eighth graders. So just to clear up that confusion. All right, eighth graders, you may rise and we'll commence the receiving of their diplomas and Bibles. Laura Elizabeth Cleveland. Madeline Ann Grease. Ashton Joy Kelsbeek. Kelsey Renee Camps. Emma Rose Captain Harry Anthony Langerak. Megan Elizabeth Lanning. Molly Elise Snippy. Molly's going to come up here and give her valedictorian address. Welcome parents, grandparents, family, and friends. I'm privileged to stand before you this evening as we celebrate the graduating classes of 2023 and I'm thankful to be a part of this ceremony and to stand with wonderful classmates. With great thankfulness, God has upheld our little school another year, and only by his grace. We recognize our unworthiness and our nothingness. If God was not with us, all of our efforts would be for nothing and our school would be lost. God has used very weak means in the education of his covenant seed, but God has prospered the work done at Grace Reformed Protestant School. And God continues to keep us in the palm of his hand. It is very evident that our God is sovereign and what a comfort that we can rest in that truth. While our inaugural school year had a bumpy beginning but ended smoothly, this school year began smoothly and ended somewhat painfully. If we look at all of this with our earthly eyes, it would be easy to despair and to be troubled. But we know that God works all things for our good and he has ordered all of the events of this past year and also what will occur in the future. We trust in him alone. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, we read, He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. He is our rock, 
And despite the griefs and heartaches we've experienced, God is always good. He's given us godly parents who love our Christian school as a demand of the covenant. He's given us godly teachers and an administrator who expend themselves in our Christian education. And God has given us friends in the gospel. Our souls are knit together. God continues to give us men who open up the scriptures for us each week, and thereby God continues to give us a more profound understanding of the gospel. We know and believe that Jesus Christ alone accomplished everything for our salvation. There is not one thing we need to add. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 30 and 31. But of him are ye in, Je in Jesus Christ, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorifieth, let him glory in the Lord. To God be all the glory. He alone is worthy to be praised. <clears throat> the students asked me to speak this evening on Isaiah 41, and that's their class text, Isaiah 41, 8 through 10. So we'll dwell a few moments on that, but let's open our Bibles to Isaiah 41. We'll read the first 10 verses, and then take as that class text, verses 8 through 10. Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and, gave, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword and has dri driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done, done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last. I am He. The isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came they helped every one his neighbor, and every one said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness." This text that the graduating students chose this evening is a marvelous text. It's a marvelous and glorious text, and it's extremely applicable to the church of Jesus Christ today. And to understand this text, we need to understand what's going on in the first seven verses of Isaiah 41. Understand here that Isaiah is in vision. He's received a tremendously powerful vision from the Lord. And that vision, what he received, was the scene of great warfare. This scene where this man from the east, this righteous man from the east, 
That righteous man from the east is Cyrus, whom the Lord God would raise up. The Lord God would raise up to come against the Babylonians and to crush the Babylonians and to rule over them and have dominion over Babylon. He gives them as dust to his sword and driven stubble to his bow. So the scene, the scene that we come upon is a great, tremendously powerful vision of events that were going to come to pass soon. And so this scene is also of the nations as they prepare for this great king of Cyrus to come upon the land. And we have that, what does this nation do as they prepare for this battle? Verses 6-7, through seven, They helped everyone his neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, Be of good courage. So all of these men and women, all of the children of the land, who see this great king coming from the east, this great king, this mighty king Cyrus, who's coming to conquer Babylon, these nations say to each other, all the people of the land, be be strong and of good courage. And they pat each other on the back, and then they fashion to themselves sturdy idols. That's verse 7. The carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer that smote the anvil. They fashioned idols of gold and silver to trust, and that was their confidence. Here comes this mighty conquering king. And they trusted in their idols and placed them securely. And so we have God speaking in the beginning of this text. He's speaking about these events that would transpire and come to pass. And now the question is, Who calls this mighty, conquering King Cyrus? Who calls the nations of the earth? Who bends all men to His will? Who does that? And God asks the question and God gives the answer. I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am He. I, the Lord, called this King. I, the Lord, put this king under my feet and moved him to do my will. To conquer the nation of Babylon and put this king on his throne. I, the Lord, who have decreed the beginning from the end. I, the Lord, who have determined all things according to my counsel. And God addresses not only the nations then, but He addresses the people of Judah themselves. Judah here understand is the Old Testament church. The Old Testament church, and he has a word to say. This word, this vision that Isaiah, we find Isaiah in, it's prophetic. It's a prophetic viewpoint. Because remember, Israel is going to be in captivity at that point. Judah is going to be in captivity in the land of Babylon. And here this great king comes. Who's going to be in the middle of it all? Israel. Judah. The people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, is right in the middle of this great conflict that Isaiah sees. They're already captive. And God speaks to His people the words of this text. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen. And He says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I am thy God. He speaks to this people who are going to be ensued in this great conflict, this great warfare, this great battle. And he says, don't fear. Don't be dismayed. Fear and dismay is born of unbelief. It's a fruit of unbelief. Fear and dismay is not a fruit of faith. All these events though, all these events in the land were of God. God is absolutely sovereign over all these events in the land. Then what reason is there to fear? All is well with God's covenant people. There's nothing, no reason for fear, no reason to be dismayed. So then that word to us is especially applicable. Fear thou not, 
graduating students, for I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, I will strengthen thee. So let's consider then briefly under the speech, under the theme, God's church without fear, or Israel's church without fear, or Jacob's, Jacob Israel's church without fear, will have three main points that we'll cover. This, this church is sovereignly chosen, this church is sovereignly called, and this church is sovereignly preserved. So this church is called in our text Israel and Jacob. Israel. Israel is the church that prevails. Israel is God's conquering prince. Israel is a beautiful, beautiful description of the church. In this word Jacob, Jacob's being used in the same way, in a beautiful way in our text. Jacob is the wrestler in the covenant. The wrestler for the cause of the covenant. So we have this word, Jacob Israel. That's who the church is. Church in the New Testament and the Israelites of Israel, they're one church. That's a lovely description too. Wrestler. Wrestler in the cause. Wrestler for the cause of God's covenant. Israel which prevails which prevails and conquers all her foes, victorious by grace alone in Jesus Christ. That's lovely. And then our word, the church is also called the seed of Abraham, my friend. The seed of Abraham. The seed. The seed is all those who are chosen. All those chosen according to the election of grace. The one true seed of Abraham And this church is being described by its positive element. It's the elect. It's the company of the predestinated. That's the church of Jesus Christ. And this church is chosen to be her friend. Chosen to be be the friend of God. This relationship of the church we have standing before God. The church is the servant. And the members of that covenant are all the friend servants of God. They're chosen. They're chosen to stand. They're chosen to stand in the world in the midst of this great conflict. And this servant is God's friend. Abraham, my friend. means my lover. God is speaking here about His covenant. His love language. Abraham, my lover. Abraham was not just the servant of God. Abraham was the friend of God. Abraham lived in the highest bliss and happiness and joy in the covenant of grace of Jesus Christ. And that's the church. The church is the fellowship of those who are the friend servants of the living God. In this church, this church of Jesus Christ, she's chosen. She's marked out. She's set apart. She's elected to be God's. And God, what He's doing here in, our, in this text, this wonderful text that the students chose this evening, is God speaking Election theology. He's preaching that to the church. God wasn't afraid to preach election theology to the church of Jesus Christ. He says, I have chosen thee. I have marked thee out. I have set thee aside. Thou art mine. God wasn't afraid of election theology. That all of salvation, all of the blessings of salvation, membership in the covenant, all of it has its root and origin in the election of God, in His gracious and sovereign decree to save a people to Himself. He marked thee out. He marked out His church. He set them aside to be His friend servants in the world. And what's the cause then? Cause of being chosen, of this so- being sovereignly chosen by God. 
the cause of Israel being Israel, the cause of the church being the church, what is it not? God's church does not become worthy by what she does. God does not mark out those whom He will after they have repented, or after they have believed enough, or after they have obeyed the law, or after they have become worthy, or believed enough. But God chose them with an electing, saving love. God loves His church. He delights in His church because He delighted in Jesus Christ. That church is eternally joined to Jesus Christ. He sees that church covered in the blood of the Lamb, slain before the foundation of the world. That church is, that church is precious to Him. It's lovely. It's delightful to Him. Because He sees His Son live in and through that church and redound to His glory alone. And negatively, God did not cast thee away. So verse 41 says in, or rather chapter 41, at the end of verse 9, I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. God is saying here, I haven't rejected thee. I haven't rejected thee. That's reprobation in the text. God preaches election and He shows reprobation here in the text too. Election is of God. His electing saving grace. And that is the cause of the church being gathered. The church being chosen and being made the friend servants of the living God in the midst of this dark, evil world. And then in this truth, in that truth, the truth of election is the power of the text. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will never forsake thee. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. God will never forsake the work of His hands. God will never leave His church. He swore by His name. He swore by no greater thing. The church is sovereignly chosen. And this church is then sovereignly called to verse 9, those whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men. God says, I grab hold of my people. I lay hold on them. I seize them. He literally takes them to himself. He calls them. And that was first of all then literally true. What did he do with Abraham? He took Abraham out of the land of the Chaldees, he called them unto himself, and he put Abraham in Israel and his seed. And all around were all the heathen nations. If God was going to try and preserve Israel, you would think he wouldn't have put all the enemies around her. But he does. He takes and puts Israel surrounded by enemies on every side. Places them right in the middle. And that church is called to dwell alone. She's called to dwell alone spiritually. But geographically, it's impossible. It was impossible for Israel to dwell alone. She lived side by side. The nations of the heathen were right on the edges. And that's true of the church today. A call to dwell alone spiritually in truth and right doctrine. But our students... Our graduating students, they have to join the workforce where they're going to work shoulder to shoulder with ungodly men who take the Lord's name in vain. They're going to work shoulder to shoulder to all sorts of men and women who live licentious lives. Or they're going to go to college where they hear the vain babblings of a professor denying creation. They're, going, they're called to live spiritually alone. 
but yet they still dwell in the world. And what does God say too? He calls His church from the chief men thereof. And that just literally means He calls them from the corners. He calls them from the edges of the earth. They're insignificant. He calls the nobodies. He calls the nothings. He doesn't call the people who have strength and power in themselves. He doesn't call the noble. He calls the nobodies and the insignificant. And that's so no flesh can glory in His sight. That no man may take His glory from Him, for He is a consuming fire. And what's the spiritual significance then of these people whom God calls? He calls those who are His enemies. He calls those who love the darkness, who hate the light, who dwell in the darkness, and wallow in that darkness as blind Groping in that darkness. He calls those who are His enemies. He calls those who are strangers to His covenant. He calls the ungodly. That's who He justifies. He he justifies those who are damn worthy sinners of themselves. Romans 8, verse 30. And God chose to Himself a people. This call of God is always a creative call. He calls irresistibly, powerfully, efficaciously by His Holy Spirit. It's the work of that sovereign calling God to save His people. It's that work of the Holy Spirit that brings into His church all the riches of Jesus Christ so they lack nothing. He calls His people into His church. And what's the purpose then of being called of God? We're made friend servants of His. We're visible. The church is visible representatives of the invisible God in this world. And the church is called to worship. She's called to serve. She's called to glorify Him. And His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to praise Him for the gracious salvation freely given. And created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And thankfulness and gratitude. That's the purpose of the sovereign calling of God. And God protects. He preserves. His church And so we have the application then of these beautiful truths of God's sovereign calling and God's sovereign choosing of His people. God preserves His church. It doesn't depend upon man. It doesn't depend upon any way upon man. There's nothing of man here in this text. Nothing of man's working. Nothing of man's willing. If there was, it would spoil the whole thing. It would be rotten. Remember the context of what's happening here. All this mighty King Cyrus, he's coming. He's coming to conquer Babylon. And there's Israel standing in the middle of it. What's Israel, what's the church going to do in this situation? Don't come with man. Don't come to me with man. There's no help for man. No help whatsoever in the preservation of the church. What did the heathen do? In verse 6 and 7, they patted each other on the back. They said, be be courageous. They built them sturdy idols of man to trust in, of gold and silver. If we do that tonight with the graduating students, we're no better off than the heathen were. Pat these graduate students on the back and say, now go out there, be ambitious, be, mo- be motivated, get a good job, and you will do well. Be, cur- be courageous. These students don't have any strength of themselves. There's no comfort in themselves. There's no comfort in us. Man cannot be the reason to not fear, to have no fear. 
God has chosen, God has called, God has preserved. He will preserve His church. That's the only reason not to fear this evening. We're in this great conflict with the heathen all around. And the church is right in the middle of it. But God controls the nations. God's sovereign over all by His Word and by His Spirit, governing and upholding all things. And He moves all things for the purpose He has decreed. And God delights in His church. That's the reason not to fear. That's the reason not to be dismayed. He is for us. He is our God. This God of the church bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's our boast. That's our confidence. That's the reason not to fear this evening. Not to be afraid. And by His almighty power, verse 10, by His almighty power, I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That power of His righteousness is salvation for the church. And that power of His right hand is destruction for the wicked, for the reprobate. And God's sovereignty then, God's sovereignty is the, is the, the fact of that sovereignty is the application then. Fear not. Be not dismayed. You are safe. You are preserved. You are protected in Jesus Christ. Do not fear. Do not dismay. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Thank you.
We'll now have the presentation of the diplomas for the seniors, so you can arise. Caleb Garrett Cleveland. David Aaron Cleveland. Ethan Michael Cleveland. Isaac Everett Gearlings. Owen Elliot Greece. Jamie Ellen Camps. Eli Michael Langerak. Jeremy Richard Langerak. Ruth Elizabeth Uphoff. At this time, we'll have the seniors turn around. Eighth graders, could you please rise as well and turn around and face the audience? We now present with thankfulness to God the graduating class of 2023. Hello, everybody. Today marks the end of the second year of schooling at Grace Reform Protestant School, and with it, the second graduating class of the high school. Looking back over these past 13 years, I never expected to be in this situation, and I don't think anyone else here really did. Growing up, I thought that my life would be normal, that I would go to the same school that my parents did, that I would go to the same church for the rest of my life, because why would I change now? Back in 2015 to 2020, there wouldn't be a split. God would preserve his church, right? That's what I thought. Fast forward to 2021, the summer after my sophomore year. Suddenly everything is in doubt and uncertainty. Is there going to be a school? Will I have to go to a public school? Even if they do put together something, would it be a real school? These doubts and uncertainties troubled me, but the word of God brings comfort and guidance to us. Isaiah 41 verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. This verse is part of our class text. 
and it rings true today as it did then. We have nothing to fear, not then, not now, and not going forward. God is with us, he will strengthen us, and he will be the one who upholds us. This is a blessed word. These past years, months, and even weeks have been brutal, brutally difficult for all of us in an earthly sense. And without God upholding us, we cannot be where we are today. As we gather here today for this occasion of graduation, what can we do other than give all praise, honor, and thanks to God? If it were up to me those couple years ago, I know I wouldn't be here. I can't speak for my classmates on that one, but I can say that we are all incredibly glad that we are here. God's hand graciously guiding us through all of this is abundantly clear. The parents who supported us, the teachers and staff that taught us at school, the ministers who led us out of the PRC, and everyone else involved, all of them were ordained by God. We are immensely grateful for the work all of them did, but it was ultimately God's work through them, and that is where true thankfulness lies. Moving forward now into the real world, so to speak, many of us are going on to work full time. This comfort is still there. This word must still guide us, graduating class and everyone else here. As you move on, remember who your strength is because it certainly isn't yourself. And remember who upholds you because it isn't your own two feet. God will provide for you. Trials, tribulations, and sorrows will continue to come as they have been, but we have no reason to fear. Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us?
Let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Father, which art in heaven, we come unto thee at the close of this joyous event. We thank thee, Lord, that we could be a part of it. We know that in the past year and a half, we have come into a new understanding of whom we deal with. We deal with Jehovah, the am that I am, who changes not. And so we pursue truth like we have not previously in our lives. Where we find only the truth in the scripture. So we bow before it. We ask as an organization as we move forward that we continue to do that. We have asked for thy wisdom and we have received it and we continue to do that. Now be with our little school in the next few weeks and months. Preserve us if it be thy will. Keep us from sin, we pray. In Christ's name alone, amen. Becca, do you want to come up and do a recessional for us? Thanks. All right, graduating class, you can rise and walk down the center aisle in single file fashion once the music starts. <laughs>